The idea about monotasking is not to do less in life. It's to like live a very full, colorful life and do all the things you want to do. Just give your attention to one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And if I say that, people might say, well, where, where do I start? Yeah. And the simple answer is, well, what are you doing right now? <laughs> are you multitasking? Can you strip away the multiple things you're doing and pick one of them? That can be hard for people. Like if I said, just go answer all your emails, like it's impossible to go do that, right? You're, you're not going to get them all done. You're going to be tempted to do other things and you're going to burn out partway through it. Mm -hmm. So this approach I decided to take um, is much more about training what I call our monotasking muscles. Yes. And that can be done by doing anything with your full attention, one thing at a time. Welcome back to the program, everybody. First off, this guy's the coolest name in the world. In fact, I thought it was a wine label when I first started reading about him. And then as I started to read about his work, I'm like, uh oh, I love what this guy is teaching. I love his lessons. And I cannot wait to share this man and his work with my audience. So my guest today is the founder and CEO of Juniper Books. But he wrote a book that called the 12 monotasks that just took my breath away. And I couldn't put it down. I read it all in one setting. So this gentleman is uh, really going to share some unique info with you all today about how to be really more productive and be happier. So Thatcher Wine, thank you for being here, brother. Thanks, Ed. It's really nice to be here. And thanks for the, the really nice hint. <laughs> is it all your life that people comment on your name, Thatcher Wine? I mean, come on, man. Yeah, I was going to I was going to comment on your 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 nice introduction. Um, yeah, nobody believes me. That's my real name. <laughs> um, but both parts of it are unusual and both parts of it are real. The origin just, you know, to explain that are in case anyone's curious, like there's there's no origin story online about it. But my parents heard Thatcher as like the, a partner in a law firm. Mm -hmm. Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett sounded very distinguished. <laughs> so they took the Thatcher and gave it to me. Yeah. And, and then my last name used to be a little bit longer uh, a few generations ago and it was shortened sure. to wine. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's memorable and one of the great stage names of all names of all time. That's not a stage name. So <laughs> anyway, let's get into your work, which is the reason I had you. I didn't have you on for your name. And but I, I had a guest, I have to share something. I had a guest on recently. She's a neuroscientist, Anishi Ja. Mm -hmm. And she's really into mindfulness and she basically said that they've proved in the brain that you really can't multitask, that it's actually a fallacy. So your work has actually been validated by neuroscientists, except you take an approach that I think is much more easy to understand. And so where did you come up with the concept of monotasking? And why did you come up with it? So a lot of it, you know, came from my own personal experience. Originally, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I have a company uh, called Juniper Books for about 20 years now also a parent. I also went through some kind of next level distracting experiences. A few years ago, I went through cancer, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, all at the same time that I was trying to, you know, be a good parent and navigate my way through life and deal with the distractions that pretty much ever, all of us are dealing with, right? Mm. We all have really long to-do lists. There's a lot we want to do in life. And we have these, you know, smartphones that, you know, mm -hmm. tempt us to multitask all the time. So I felt like I had to look at what I was doing um, and figure out when I was the most successful, the least stressed, the most creative and figure, because when I was dealing with those things like cancer, and I also went through a divorce right after cancer, I was like, I have to stay focused. I have to figure out how to do that for myself. And I want to like, look into the research about productivity, about neuroscience and see what that says about how other people do it. And I wanted to find out a, a method that worked for me and then eventually share it with other people. And that's how I, I came to the you know conclusions about monotasking versus multitasking. So for me, you know, I work with a lot of high performers. I, I coach them. And, and by the way, I must tell you that that's the thing they're singularly best at is sometimes in athletics, they'll call it the zone or focus. But really what that means is the elimination of other tasks and other thoughts. And you're completely present in the moment. For me, that's when I'm the best dad, as you said. It's when I'm the best entrepreneur. It's when you're the best athlete. It's when you're best at anything is when you're completely present. Yet most people, this is why your work is so compelling. Most people really struggle with this, myself included. So why'd you come up with 12 of these monotasks? If you don't mind, I'll share with them because I want to get the book. But the monotasks are reading, walking, listening, sleeping, eating, getting there, which is an interesting one, learning, teaching, playing, which I love, seeing, creating, and thinking. These are 12 monotasks. Why 12? Because it was catchy? Or was there something behind the idea of these individual 12 monotasks? 
there's definitely something behind all of them. And, and the idea overall, you know, like the, the book cover, you know, has all 12 of those illustrated. Mm -hmm. And the idea about monotasking is not to do less in life. It's to like live a very full, colorful life and do all mm -hmm. the things you want to do. Just give your attention to one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And if I say that people might say, well, where, where do I start? Yeah. And the simple answer is, well, what are you doing right now? <laughs> are you multitasking? Can you strip away the multiple things you're doing? and pick one of them. That can be hard for people. Like if I said, just go answer all your emails, like it's impossible to go do that, right? You're, you're not going to get them all done. You're going to be tempted to do other things and you're going to burn out partway through it. Mm -hmm. So this approach I decided to take um, is much more about training what I call our monotasking muscles. Yes. And that can be done by doing anything with your full attention, one thing at a time. And you mentioned, you know, high performers like athletes, and there are other people like, you know, musicians who need to do one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. The more they do it, the better at it they become. Yeah. We can all do that. We don't have to be professionals. Mm -hmm. So for me, the 12 monotasks journey, if you will, started with reading because I'm, I'm in the book business. Yeah. I've been selling books for a long time. I've been thinking, why, why is it important for me to encourage people to read and to have books in their home? And I thought, hmm, you know, it's not just about like the stories you tell on the pages or you learn the information you get, the entertainment you're provided with. It's about the fact that you can only do one thing at a time when you're reading a book. If your mm -hmm. attention is on the page and you start daydreaming about something else or your kids ask you a question or your phone beeps, you pretty much have to go back and reread that. Yes. Yeah. And so whereas if you're watching the movie, like you can just kind of have to pay attention and you might get it. Mm -hmm. So I thought like, that's a feature. That's not a flaw of books. That's mm -hmm. why I think people love them. That's why people like Oprah Winfrey and Warren Buffett are such avid readers and so successful. Mm -hmm. They build their attention span, their ability to do lots of things really well in the world by reading. Let's stay on that for a second. Can we stay yeah. on that? I want to stay in there with you. So I'm prepping for the interview with you on monotasking, reading your stuff. And I'm like, I'm already pretty good at this. And then I'm not exaggerating. I have to tell everybody this. I literally checked my phone because it was in my lap as I was doing it. And then I realized the television was on in the background. And so I literally said to myself, this is a muscle that I have still not built. So is it as practical? Is there a practical application as simple as saying, get in a quiet space and begin to read and have no other instruments on, no other stuff distracting you. And you begin to build the muscle simply by doing that in your own presence. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, reading. So I say do something every day that that strengthens your ability to pay attention. Okay. Reading is such a clear one that for a lot of people, it's a great one to start with. You can read for five minutes. That's better than no minutes. Okay. If you read for 20 minutes, like studies have shown that that has a big impact on reducing our stress level mm -hmm. and readers tend to live longer. So there are lots of benefits. They, fall, you know, they get more sleep than people who look at their phone before they go to bed. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, start where you are. And if it's don't don't read on a screen like because that then you'll be tempted to look at all the other things and the links okay. and the word definitions and all that. But if you read on paper, it can be a newspaper, a magazine or a book. It's all helpful. We're going to talk about that later. The presence of other work you've done of just physical books. I want to get to that maybe towards the end. But these muscles. So I just, everyone listening or watching this right now, if you struggle with being really, really busy, but not as productive as you would like to be, this is up your alley. If you struggle with, I was just in a conversation with my kids, but I was thinking about work when I was talking with them. Or I'm at a lunch with a friend and I can't stop looking at my phone and my text messages. These are much muscles of yours that have either atrophied or have never been developed. And it robs you of your bliss. It robs you of your productivity. I think for me, the biggest thing I'm chasing in my life is more peace and I think it robs you of your peace. So let's just break down a couple of the other ones. This is because I think they're sort of interesting. So you said teaching, which I think for most people, it's a random one to me. Like, well, most people are thinking, well, I don't even have anything to teach or teach other people things. How can I build the muscle of being one of the monotasks be teaching? It's a, it's a great question. So mm -hmm. I'm not a professional teacher. Um, yet when I looked at my day and my week and everything, like I, I teach a lot of people, a lot of things. And I think we all do like I teach my dog, you know, how to 
new tricks and things like that. And I teach my kids just by setting a good example all the time. I hope <laughs> I, you know, teach my, my team at the office, you know, how to do parts of my job that I used to do that now they do, or how to provide great customer service. No matter what you do, you can teach something to other people. Mm. And it's different from just going about your life. Like if you really bring your full attention to it, you can develop a focus that, you know, you can, that the teachers that we've have been influential in our lives mm -hmm. have had, we've seen it before, right? Mm -hmm. The person standing at the front of the class, they couldn't be daydreaming while teaching something. They Absolutely. couldn't have their phone out being interrupted all the time. It was frustrating probably if they got, you know, interruptions of various sorts from students or whatever. So if you think about great teachers and how they bring their full attention to what they're teaching and then apply it to everything you're doing in life that you may want to pass on to other people, mm -hmm. then you can not only like do a good job teaching, but mm -hmm. you can also maybe develop some mastery that you didn't know you had. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I mean, like, you know, my daughter said like, Oh, you're so great at guitar. You know, I'm like, so, so, um, but like, you know, can you teach me those chords? Then I have to really think about, wow, you know, what, what are the chords? How do I teach them? What's the right method? And you develop this focus and attention that maybe you didn't know you had and some skills you didn't know you had. Yep. And that, that helps yeah, throughout our lives. So what I love about this is it's completely counterculture. Our culture now celebrates the fallacy of multitasking. You know, it's the notion of I'm driving my kids to school and I'm on the phone and I'm getting ready for work and I'm doing this. But you're really not. You're only your brain has been proven is you're only doing one of those things at once. So you're not multitasking. You could be task switching, which is different, switching from task to task. But every study proves that you are more powerful and more influential if you can stay in the task longer and maybe even to its completion. For me, this is a really interesting thing I want to ask you about. For me, I think the way you start your day sets a structure, a syntax, and creates kind of momentum for it. This is how I look at a day. Most people wake up right? How would you explain this to somebody? They wake up and they're immediately doing, or they think they're doing five things at once. They're getting up, they're stretching, they're brushing their teeth, they're getting their hair, they're on their phone, they're checking Instagram, they're checking on their kids and friends, they're, do, they're cooking breakfast. What would be something you would say to start a day so that I can begin to structurally change my life to be more present from the minute my eyes wake up? Is there something that you do or a hack for that? Yeah. So that's such a great way of putting it just to, I think everybody can relate to that feeling of waking up yep. and just like, boom, you know, like you got to be firing on all cylinders all at once. Mm -hmm. There's one of the monotasks in the book is about sleeping. Mm -hmm. And the sleeping monotask is not just about like, okay, wear yourself down to the point you're exhausted, then get in bed and get as much sleep as possible. You and I know it doesn't work that way. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, you have to like monotask your sleep. And that includes when you wake up. And a lot of people these days, the first thing they do when they wake up is reach for their phone. Yeah. And, you know, it just immediately sets into motion a uh, bunch of mul multitasks, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Maybe some sorts of, you know, emotional ups and downs about, you know, upsetting things you see in the news or text or social media. And I like to start my day with, with some peace, like you said, some quiet. So sometimes I'll stay in bed, just reach for a book or a magazine and, you know, stay there for 20 minutes and read. And it just like, starts my day in a much more calm place. I also, you know, take my time. I take like, I, I guess I, I've over the years made myself have the luxury of a couple hours yeah. to start my morning with all the things that are important to me for self-care, like stretching, making a cup of tea. I get up before my kids. I just really like that quiet time. Hey, can I say yeah. something about that? I want to we always yeah. go back and forth on my show. I can hear the alphas going, no, I get up and <laughs> I crush and I go. And I want you all to know that I'm an alpha and I'm going to tell you right now, I just started to get up a little bit earlier to give myself the gift of that time. So I'm not crushing less. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, on it less. I am up a little bit earlier to give myself that structure, that pattern. I want to create a pattern early in my day that says I can monotask. I can be in the presence of what I'm doing. And if you don't create that pattern to begin your day and you just get up and it's go, you are going to be less productive, less happy. Mm -hmm. You're going to look back at weeks, days, months of your life and go, what did I actually get done? And man, I didn't even have any fun doing it because I was never present anywhere that I was. So I just want everybody to get this. We're also, and I want you to speak to this if you could, Thatcher. 
we've become conditioned to be overstimulated. It's a conditioning, right? It's the phone, it's the TV, it's the email, it's the text, it's the all these things. It's like it's become a conditioning about the last decade or so in our culture to the extent that we're not even aware we do it. Because everyone's listened to a podcast, get up, pray, meditate, stretch, have gratitude. You know, be everyone hears that yet almost nobody does this stuff because I don't think they know the underlying reasons why they should. So would you agree that this building of the muscles is also a conditioning we have to take control of ourselves? Otherwise, external forces condition our entire life. You know, over the past few decades, like life has only gotten busier and busier. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of this glorification that you've, you've mentioned, like about looking like you're doing all these things and crushing all the time and, you know, multiple businesses and side hustles and, you know, I can do it all and showing that off on social media, like that's become the norm. Mm -hmm. And life is only going to get more distracting in the future. It's only going to get busier. Yes. The financial pressures, societal pressures, cultural pressures, like to be doing more and keep up are just going to get worse or harder, depending on how you look at it. So I feel like we have to, you know, press pause, look at, is this sustainable? Yeah. Are we able to do all the things that are on our to-do list? I've got like 46, you know, post-it notes over here. Yeah. <laughs> Never so going to get to all here. of them. Right. <laughs> and I want to have fun. I want to have a great life. You know, I want to yeah. like spend time with my kids. I want to go to see concerts. I want to like do all the hobbies I love and take trips. But I don't want to be like, oh, I'm going to work so hard for 50 weeks and then take two weeks off and it's going to be amazing. And then I'm going to get back to the beginning. So I think we have to come up with a more sustainable way to live our lives. And monotasking provides that because you can drop into it anywhere you are, anytime you are with any activity. You can just decide, I'm going to live in the moment, this moment. This is where everything happens. And you could choose from among the 12 monotasks in the book and say, you know, I'm going to focus on thinking right now or I'm going to focus on creating, or I'm going to take a break. Like I am burnt out. I'm going to go for a walk for 20 minutes. You can do any of those things. And as long as you do it with your full attention, you'll reconnect with yourself and it'll be so much more nourishing and recharging than the way we did it before. So I was preparing to interview you. I do all this stuff, like maybe like a month and a half in advance, because sometimes there's things people teach. I want to actually do them mm -hmm. and know whether I endorse doing it or not. So maybe it's even been two months with your stuff. And it was interesting for me, I just want to share with you and tell my audience that there's a power to intention, just intending to be present. So I started to do that. Like, this sounds really contrived, but I walk into my daughter's room now. I purposely walk in her room. I purposely tell myself before I go there, I'm going to be completely present. I don't bring my phone in her room. And I just sit at the end of her bed and we talk. And sometimes those are four minute conversations. And sometimes they're an hour. And they've enriched my soul to a, an extent I can't even begin to explain. Here's what's crazy about it. Then when I leave there, there's this pattern in muscle. And then when I do go to now do my work, I'm actually completely present in that work. And I don't know if it's because I'm present or in my mind, I go, okay, I did do something with my daughter that I know is meaningful to me, but I did it. So I just want to acknowledge you for the fact that you're, what you're saying is super true about just the intention. So if you'd speak to that for a minute and then give us another hack, what's something Thatcher wine, the best dude on the planet, supposedly, right? He wrote the book on it. So he's one of them at monotasking or at least intentionally. What's another thing he does to bring himself to build those muscles that he does on a daily or weekly basis. And I see your face changing when I said you were the best. In the world. So, <laughs> so let's, let's say one of the best. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, the whole book's not in monotasking in general. It's not about like achieving some sort of monotasking sainthood. Right. We're not like everything is going to be always perfect and you're always right. able to focus on one thing. It's about awareness, you know, like, mm -hmm. and just bringing your awareness to that. Like, am I multitasking? Did I go into my daughter's room with my phone and, you know, my like thinking about that email and paying attention to, you know, some other conversation or am I right there, right at that moment with mm -hmm. the person I love and care about and want to connect with and want to set a good example for. So that kind of awareness is, is super important. I, and I really appreciate you sharing that story. What are some of the things I do? I mean, one, on a regular basis, every night I, I sleep in a pillow fort is one thing. <laughs> a what? A pillow, a pillow fort. fort. Yeah. I'm, okay. a, I'm a grown adult <laughs> and I, I make a pillow fort every night. And I like have pillows all around me. Some people like use a weighted blanket for the same thing. I like these really heavy pillows all around me that kind of wedge me in. 
Mm. And I noticed a few years ago, I, I had a injury and I had to sleep like kind of propped up in this fort. So I wouldn't roll over on my arm in the middle of the night mm. and wake myself up in pain. But then I started doing it more and more. And I was like, I get better sleep doing this. And mm. there's a mantra I use in the book, um, which is sleep on rails. Each chapter has yeah. a mantra. Yeah. And so this idea of sleeping on rails is like, as if you're on a train and you can't choose where to get off. Like the train's just going where it's going. So mm. sleeping in the pillow fort is kind of like that for me. Mm. And it's like, I don't roll over, you know, like I'm, I'm locked in and I get much better sleep that way. See, I thought you were going to categorize that under playing because one of the other monotasks is playing. And what I value, like, it's so good. Just draws your attention to like, how much learning am I doing? How much playing am I doing? How much creating? These are the mono tasks, mm -hmm. right? And creating, I do. I do a lot of creating. I do some thinking. But playing, I was like, how much of my day, my week, my month did I spend playing? Like a child, like joyful, like fun stuff, intentionally. And then when I'm doing it, not doing other crap. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, if, if I ranked it, and I know I'm sounding like I'm ranking stuff today. I'm like a zero out of a bazillion at playing other than like golf, you know, other than right. that, there's no other playful part of my life that I'm intentional about. It looked like you wanted to add something on that. So I didn't want to. Well, yeah. I mean, it. yeah, no, I mean, I'm playing. I, I share in the introduction to that chapter, like I have not historically been the best at playing. Mm -hmm. I've always thought like, oh, I have too much work to do. And even when I go to a concert and I've like been going to much more live music now that it's, it's come back and I, I love it. It helps, you know, when I can truly drop into being there and only listen to the music and having a great time and dancing and being with my friends, like it's amazing. Yeah. I do have to catch myself though, because every now and then I'm tempted to take a picture <laughs> right. like other people at live shows these days, you see a lot of people with their phones and my rule is, is one photo per concert. If I get a great one, awesome. I'll share it. If I get a terrible one, hey, I was still there. I still had a great time. I like that rule. Um, I also have to remind myself, like, when I start thinking about, you know, work while I'm standing there and listening to a show, like, you know, just gently move myself back to being in the present moment. It's like a, a meditation. It is like a meditation. And this, everyone, let's just step back, okay? What's today's show about? What's the message to you? First off, it's a question to you, I think, from me, which is, how good are you being present where you are? That's just the first thing. How good are you just being present where you are? Secondly, how good are you at doing some one thing at one time without other things taking from you? Because here's the fallacy, everybody. I'm a little further down the road. I'm a little bit older. And Thatcher is too. And I'm also blessed. We both had some financial success in our lives. I think this is what I used to believe. I'll get around to doing that stuff once I'm rich. I don't have to worry about stuff. Once I've got some money, oh, yeah, then getting up and meditating and walking around and like, yeah, having some coffee or tea. That sounds great. Right now, man, I'm trying to pay some bills. I don't think you get it, right? I'm in the hunt. You know, I'm in the grind. And what I used to think was when the conditions of my life change, my pattern will change. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be further from the truth, everybody. Number one, I could tell you that as I accumulated more things and stuff and successes, it got worse, not better. And that it's a pattern and you're conditioning yourself for the same level of stress, anxiety, frustration, depression, misery, angst that you're having now without a bunch of stuff or success. I got to ask you this. How did getting cancer change your perspective on all this stuff? That's a life changing, life altering event. And what impact did it make on you? So I had, um, you know, I'd been working really hard and I had, you know, on Juniper books and I had young kids and, um, you know, volunteering for the kids' schools and like just doing all the things all the time. I, you know, raced um, cyclocross and mountain biking for a little while. Yeah. Loved the Colorado mountains. So I was like doing all these things, you know, a lot. It sounds a lot like I was playing, but I was, I almost mm -hmm. took like too hardcore of an approach to it. Sometimes it wasn't as much mm -hmm. fun as it should have been. Mm -hmm. And then about four years ago now, I um, was diagnosed with uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma at stage two, I had three tumors in my chest. And I went through like a pretty heavy duty chemo regimen. It's about a hundred hours a week. Wow. Two weeks off and repeated that cycle um, six times. 100 hours a week. Yeah. So I was connected full time to a chemo pump. I had a portable okay. pump um, that I carried around with me and just would like make this really annoying sound all night, injecting the chemo into my system. Um, so it took a big toll on me. And, you know, a lot of people told me, slow down, you know, give yourself 
the the time to rest and recover that your your body needs. And I was like, eh, you know, but I still have all these things to do. I still want to run my business. Still want to be a good parent. Still want to show that I'm brave and optimistic and all that. And honestly, like getting through the chemo was almost just like something on the to do list. It was like, oh, got through round one, round two, round three. Like it's pretty tough about it. I didn't know that it would take me years to recover from it. That was really what changed my life mm. was trying to recover from something I didn't know was going to be so hard to recover from. Mm. And through in a divorce and my business, you know, had suffered a little bit during those wow. times. So I was like rebuilding that. So I was like, I, I got to figure out, you know, with my limited time, energy and attention, I got to figure out how to navigate my way through all these things. And that's when I kind of looked back and I thought, you know, how have I done this in the past before I was sick? Maybe while I was sick too, you know, it wasn't when I like tried to do it all at one time. It was when I just brought my attention to one thing at a time, whether it was creating a new product or working with a client or, you know, doing a piece of writing, do it well, take a break, go for a walk, go skiing, go biking, mm -hmm. spend the afternoon with my kids, you know, then come back refreshed and do the next thing with my full attention. So I just kind of codified it into a philosophy about life that, you know, I thought a lot of people could relate to and could put into place to, you know, achieve some benefits and, and goals. On some really deep level, do you think having cancer, I'm just thinking about the premise of everything you're talking about. You get cancer, you have to sort of unplug from things you were doing to almost be present doing that. And I'm wondering if by that unplugging, and getting kind of observational about your life to some extent, even though you're fighting and you're sick, I'm assuming it made you much more grateful for people or an opportunity or even your business, right? And if that is true, then could it not be true that this unplugging being present in one area actually elevates your gratitude and focus level in another one because of the absence of it, just the escape from it for a while? I know that sounds really overly philosophical and pretty deep, but I actually think there's something to that, that when you're disconnected from something temporarily, your appreciation for it grows and your focus on it can ultimately grow. I'm definitely more grateful as a result, you know, of going through what I went through, but I'm also more grateful just by being in the present moment. Um, right. yes. So people don't have to go through something that's a wake up call or a health scare or, you know, the loss of something important to them to figure out like, Hey, this is a pretty amazing life. Like, and, and if I can appreciate where I am, what I'm doing and who I'm with right now, like I can be grateful for it. And, and then I could always come back to whatever that, you know, you're doing in that present moment. So I'm grateful. Like things worked out. I had a type of cancer that was treatable considered curable and then I'm healthy four years later and have just, you know, in the past year or so started to get my full energy back. Um, it took a while and, and I'm grateful for like the perspective that it gave me, you know, I always assume like just because of my family history, I, I'd have cancer in my seventies or something, you know, and then, but to have it in my forties and to be young enough to recover and have, you know, the second half of my life ahead of me, and be able to do something, you know, meaningful with it and, and share some things with the world that are important to me that I've figured out that may, you know, benefit others. I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that opportunity. What is the connection between, if any, monotasking and mindfulness? Mindfulness is coming up more and more on my radar. I practiced it for quite a while. But is there a connection between monotasking and mindfulness, if any? Definitely. So, I, you know, I've studied mindfulness and yoga, meditation and things mm -hmm. like that over the years. I think what I decided with this book was to basically put things in a little bit more practical, simple, right. secular terms, if you will, Yeah. to make it more accessible to people who, who might say, oh, this sounds like mindfulness. I'm not, you know, not going to step over that or I'm not going to go to a yoga class or, you know, this sounds too Eastern for me. Um, because I think the reality is that, you know, the lessons have always, like, it's always been hard for human beings to pay attention <laughs> long before the iPhone smartphones, like there were wild animals and, you know, dangers in the night and, you know, natural disasters. And, and so like the history of prayer and meditation and like bringing your awareness to the present moment has, has always been there. It's been there for thousands of years. Mm. 
So however you get people to like stop thinking about the past and the future and think about the now is helpful. So I decided to come up with a different terminology and and phrase the problem not as like, you're not being mindful, Mm -hmm. or you need to meditate more, or you need to go on this retreat. It's like, no, are you multitasking? Or can you monotask? Can you stop doing six things and do one? Do it with your full attention. Does it feel good to you? Great. Keep doing it. Were you more productive? Great. Did you make fewer mistakes? Awesome. Yeah. Clarity of thought. Uh, is one of the things that's brought to me. I was was saying to somebody, I was telling them I was going to interview you. And I said, maybe I'm weird about this. But I said, when I was a little boy, it was a very, you know, kind of chaotic home for a while. Great home, but chaotic. I feel sometimes like I don't give my family credit for being as good as it was. But it was my dad was an alcoholic. And man, did I love when I could just shut the door in my room and be alone and unplug from what was going on out there. And then I remember wanting a tree house when I was a little boy. I don't know if any of you can relate to this. Just a little place that was mine that I could be quiet in. And to this day, when I'm on the road traveling, there's a moment when I get in my hotel room, and I don't know if anybody relates to this, and I shut the door and I'm alone in there and my blood pressure drops and I'm at peace. And it's actually, I, I, I believe it's because a lot of the things that I would be focused on are on the other side of that door. And I have some alone time. I like when I'm in my car and I shut the door and I'm alone and I'm there with my thoughts and I'm present with myself. If you experience any of those things, like I just described at all, I'm telling you some form of monotasking, mindfulness, and your description is perfect of your book. It's exactly what it is. It's a layman's version to some extent that's understandable and tangible about mindfulness. If any of that stuff feels good to you, this will feel great to you. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about, because you are a book publisher, but you said something that I just have grown to believe, which is you said reading is a form of self-care. Would you elaborate on Because I think a lot of people go, well, the reason I listen to your podcast is I don't like to read. I like to listen. There's a difference, though, to actually reading something. Just elaborate on that a little bit. So reading, you know, requires us to bring our full attention to the printed page. And in this example, I'm thinking about yep. true, you know, printed books. And, and like we talked about before, like if your attention wanders, you miss something. Mm-hmm. But if you give your attention to a book, you, you know, the studies have shown like your, your stress level comes down, your mm-hmm. attention is locked into one place. Mm-hmm. And, and there's also all sorts of benefits, you know, that the neuroscience has shown just about like how we create these connections in our mind about what we're, we're reading it. And then we're seeing the characters and their relationships to each other. You know, if you read the Lord of the Rings, like you're imagining the distances, you know, and the geography of, you know, different characters and their journeys, you know, that has all sorts of psychological benefits. So it is really a practice of self care. That's good for our mental health to spend some time reading. And you could combine it, you know, with that alone time, like you talked about having a reading chair, having, you know, a place, maybe you even do it, you know, at work for a few minutes, you just take a few minutes to yourself and, and read. And then, it just tends to reset our, our minds. Um, one analogy I use for people that are old enough to remember, like when our computers had to be defragmented, yep. Yep. <laughs> you know, and you like see a little graphic of like, oh, these are all, you know, pink and green or whatever color they were. And then they become the same color. Like that's mm-hmm. what happens in your brain when you read a book, like you're putting it back together. So good. Um, so, so, good. so I think it's great for us. And, and even if you don't consider yourself a reader, like just pick up a book about something that interests you. And read a little bit could be about Harley Davidson motorcycles or baseball or, you know, travel, like there's a book for everybody. I'm on to something. Uh, I've been writing about this topic, which is that if you're not you simply say, well, I'm just not a great reader. I think you should ask yourself, is that an indication of an other underlying deficiency, possibly an inability to stay focused, an inability to be present, an inability to get quiet, as opposed to just you're not good at reading and comprehending things. Is that the symptom or is there an underlying disease that may have existed all your life? And if you started to read, could you begin to build those muscles that then grow another area? I want everyone to think about this. You know, I always talk about if you want to grow in your business or your finances, pick another area you can control, like your body. Move your body, change your body. When you begin to change yourself physically, you can change the other parts of your life, right? Because you've created this momentum and this pattern. Reading is another one. 
And it's just dawned on me recently that as you, if you may be an advantage that you're not a good reader, because this is an area where you can control and you can begin to grow. And I think there's a transference effect from becoming a better reader, not only have more knowledge, more peace, more imagination, you're building these pathways he's described in your brain, but it's also something you are in control of, like your body, that as you begin to grow in that area, there's a transference effect to you financially, spiritually, emotionally, relationships, your body, and it is something within your control. The other thing you can control that you talk about, which I totally believe in, that no one talks about, is being in the presence of good books. And people think this is a little bit foofy, or maybe somewhat, uh, you have an interest in that because you're a publisher. But I believe this, being in the presence of great books around you, in your physical environment has an impact on us. You got to talk about that. So I've, I've long been an advocate for having more books in our homes and our lives. And that the physical book, like, even if you don't read these books, you know, behind you, like, right now, even if you, I read them before, or I might read them later, like, they suggest something to you, like they're, they, and it's okay that they're aspirational. Like that these are the books I want to read, or these are the books that represent who I am um, or who I want to be. And when you see them every day, you know, you're reminded of that, like that you, you wish you had the time to read them. You want to be the person who read those books. There's nothing wrong with, with that. Um, I think it's a good thing because you're basically setting a, a goal and an intention that, you know, you want to be that person and you want to read those books. And, and if you have read them, all the better. And, and then you have something to come back and monotask with, you know, spend the 20 minutes rereading a favorite passage or part of a book. So books, I think are just great for our lives, you know, and I, I love seeing them, you know, in hotels and restaurants and, you know, retail stores, you know, where I go and, and people, because they, they suggest this idea of like a certain gravitas um, mm -hmm. that's counter culture to like, some of like the, you know, just everything being digital, everything being a little bit, you know, short lived and superficial books are like, they're heavy duty. <laughs> they, they can last yep. for hundreds of years. Yep. Um, and you can find like the more of them there are out there and the more you have in your home, the more either you or your kids or your guests, like will intersect with them. And that can only lead to good things. I agree. I think books have energy. Yep. Let me say that again to everybody. I believe books have energy mm -hmm. as a very young man, one of the most prolific and most influential people in my life, a prolific author is a gentleman named Wayne Dyer. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Thatcher knows who he was. I met him and he was a great writer. And he said, Ed, when I write, I surround myself. I sit in a circle of my favorite books and the wisdom and the energy from those books mm -hmm. feeds my wisdom and energy. And I thought, wow, that's about as foofy and goofy as you get. Then I started doing it. And I'm like, you know, when I do hold my scripture, when I hold Think and Grow Rich, when I hold these books, The Richest Man in Babylon, these books that have influenced me, whether I've even read them or not, as you've said, there's an energy and a wisdom. And for you to have, Thatcher does this, but like I was reading where you did Gwyneth Paltrow's bookshelves and library. And when you walk in, there's an, that becomes an energy in that room. Winning and happiness is as much environmental as it is mental. And when you can create an environment, a sanctuary of great energy and positivity, well, if you listen, you say, well, I live in an apartment, create a small space near your desk with your favorite books, surround yourself with your favorite books, compare that to scrolling on your Instagram feed, compare those two things, energy wise, bliss wise, peace wise, you could be a completely different person, right? There's nothing in your Instagram feed most of the time that's feeding you other than Ed my let's posts that are really feeding you <laughs> changing your life. But a lot of times, these books can feed you. They have wisdom and energy in them. And I, I, it was, I actually wish we covered this earlier in the show because I think it's one of the most profound things that you talk about, that I actually talk about, that we sort of share is the power of having books and becoming a better physical reader, which I was terrible at. And now I've built that muscle. I'm curious for you, if you could go back to the little boy that's you, you've had a pretty interesting life, man. You've written a book. You've interacted with some really famous and successful people. You had a life-threatening illness. You've had a divorce. You've had a family. You've written this great book. Is there something, if you could go back and counsel the 10-year-old, the 20-year-old you, that maybe you know now you didn't know then about life, what would you say to, to you? It would definitely be, you know, slow down and, and live a more balanced life. You know, it's, 
impressive, I guess, to hear all the things that I've done. And that's great. But, mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't always, you know, going in one direction. There were definitely a lot of, you know, downs. They were difficult to get through. And I think if I you know, took a little bit more of a steady, patient, balanced approach, um, it would be more sustainable. And, and one major example that I don't need to go back to being a little boy just a few years ago, like maybe if I had slowed down and monotasked my health a little bit, bit better while I was going through cancer treatment, like I could have recovered in one year instead of three years from chemo. I don't know. I don't lose any sleep over that, but, but it's possible that that's what I should have done. You know, a lot of, I go through this at the beginning of the 12 monotasks too, just like these, how we kind of project onto our lives, like the things that we've done with our computers. So I was always mm-hmm. like an early adopter. Mm-hmm. My family, you know, had an early Mac and a Commodore, you know, Vic 20 and Commodore 64 and all those sure. early computers. Um, I found a, a story I printed out like on dot matrix paper the other day from sixth grade. <laughs> you know? I remember that. And uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think I go through this in the book, how like all this technology has basically grown up with us and it's faster and faster and does more and more things. And I think like myself and a lot of other people have just been like, well, if we're inventing all these things, shouldn't we be living these faster and faster multitasking driven lives? And it wasn't until I kind of like cut the cord a few years ago, you know, detaching all the technology somewhat from my life. And, and I get to do that because I, you know, focus on a very physical product that is mm-hmm. a book that exists mm-hmm. in the real world, mm-hmm. not the digital version of it. Um, you know, that really changed my perspective too. So, yep. you know, I wish I'd come to some of those realizations earlier that like, you don't have to keep up with all the technology all the time. You can, you know, find what works for you and live a more balanced, balanced life. Yeah. And I also think slowing down, it's gotta be a better way for us to phrase that because mm-hmm. I don't think slowing down is what everybody thinks it is. I, I think you're actually in some ways accelerating when you slow down, when you monotask. Give you an example, everybody. You take any great professional athlete, you take Tom Brady compared to a rookie quarterback. What are the differences in the two of them? The game is too fast for the rookie quarterback. Everything's moving. It's happening too fast. He can't process the information. Everybody will tell you that when as they play longer, the game slows down for them. They see things more clearly. And so actually elite performers, things do slow down. It's a fallacy that you're faster and quicker and more productive. That is not true. It's not true in anything. Yet, it's what most people are chasing. And it's why the best business people I know are present in their meetings. They're, they slow down and listen, which is one of the 12 monotasks, by the way. Great athletes, the game slows down for them. Great putters in golf. When someone misses a critical putt, they go, you got a little quick right there. You got a little quick that gets them out of their vibrational frequency. It gets them out of the rhythm of success. There is a rhythm and a pace and a cadence to success and to bliss. And by the way, it's in a hurry, but it's deliberate. There's a way to be quick and fast and not in too big a hurry. And so there's this notion that you're slowing down, you're going to do less isn't actually the case. I'm telling you that it's not. The other thing I want to ask you, one of the last things I want to ask you about is memory. I was not good at this most of my life. As a consequence, I have a really terrible memory because I think I was never where I was. So often friends will say, remember that thing we did? And I'm like, like, dude, you were there. And I'm like, well, and I'm now I'm like, I don't remember it. I'm like, I was physically there, but I was probably thinking about a meeting I had on Monday or even my wife will go, do you remember when Bella the first, and I'm honestly embarrassed to say a lot of the time, No, she goes, you're kidding me. There's a picture of you there. And I'm like, well, my body was there, but my mind was obviously somewhere else. And it's affected my memory. Do you think getting good at monotasking has any impact in your neurochemistry or just in any anecdotal way to memory? Um, I do. Um, You know, I think we need to look more into like, you know, studies about it, but I think you know, just from my own experience, being fully present and fully paying attention to something helps you remember it more. Mm -hmm. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, like think of all the things we've outsourced to our devices that we don't have to remember anymore. You have to remember people's phone numbers, how to get somewhere, you know, all those things. And so like we've, we're asking less of our brains 
plus we're, you know, multitasking all the time. And so, you know, we might be at that, you know, our kids concert, but thinking about work and doing something on our phone or whatever it may be. I think there's definitely a correlation between the two of those things and our ability to, you know, fully be present and fully, you know, write the memories. I think there's also, you know, there's a lot of studies done about sleep and, you know, our ability to consolidate memories during our sleep. So if we're not getting great sleep, including deep sleep and REM sleep, we're not, you know, banking those memories. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that's, that's minimized a lot, you know, because people might be like, oh, well, you know, I got my sleep. I had, to, I had enough energy to do the day, but you're like, there are other health, mental and physical benefits of getting the sleep we need and truly monotasking that, that lead to things, those kinds of neuro, neuro improvements. Yeah. I think that I'm going to ask you one last question. I just mm-hmm. feel like for everybody listening to this is that this is ironically a really dangerous time to be alive. It's a great time. It's the best time ever to be alive. Yet it's dangerous. And it's dangerous because of all the things attempting to pull you in out of the present moment. Politics. So-and-so president did this. Oh, they did that. The news literally tells you this murder on this street matters today, but they don't report the 900 other ones. The news tells us what's important, what to believe about it what a moral person would think about it. Then we all argue about that. Then we get on social media, who's rich, who's poor, who's partying, who's not partying information. Yeah. It's everywhere pulling at us. And as a culture, we're in a really dangerous spot right now. And it's something like monotasking that could really pull you, your family and our culture back out of this really bad spiral we're in. And we're less productive. Every study says people are busier And the same studies all tell us more and more people are depressed, more and more people aren't happy. There's a direct correlation to the inverse of what we're talking about here and unhappiness. And that's why today's show is so important. So just ask yourself this, guys, if you get the book or not, I'd like you to get the book. But if you didn't, reading, evaluate that part of your life. How present are you in growing and reading? Walking, how present are you in growing and you're building that muscle of walking and being present there? listening, sleeping, eating. And and when you're eating, enjoying the meal, chewing slowly, savoring the food. It's not a race to see who can put the food in their stomach and get digestion issues the fastest. It's savoring it. It's eating for health, getting there, learning, teaching, playing, seeing. How about creating and thinking? Time to think and be present with your thoughts. So that's how valuable this man's work is. So Thatcher, last question, and thank you for today. Um, I enjoy the shows where we go back and forth more. I love me. it, yeah. I'm curious. Uh, someone says, all right, you got me. Okay, I definitely need to go to work on this. And they run into you anywhere. They go, are you Thatcher Wine? Cool name. By the way, loved your work on the Ed Milet Show. Can you give me one thing you didn't say in the interview that I could use to get started on this plan, on this process, on this journey that I didn't hear in the interview? Is there one other tidbit or step or strategy or thought you would give us? Well, then if, if they're monotasking listening, I, they will have heard it at the end here. So. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, one, one valuable thing is like, you don't, you listed out the monotasks in order. And I do start with reading and I've thought probably the most about reading, but you can drop into this anywhere that works for you. If reading doesn't work for you. Skip the reading chapter. Listen to this interview as if your life depended on it. Have a conversation with a friend as if you're recording a podcast. Like just bring your attention so much to it that, you know, it's almost uncomfortable because people don't do that these days, right? Like we're just kind of half paying attention. And then when somebody's like fully paying attention, you're like, what? <laughs> you actually heard, you know, everything I said? That's amazing. So, so start wherever it works for you. Start with playing. Go have a great time and only do that. And then like, then go back to reading, you know, see if you can like, just by practicing with other monotasks that work really well for you, go see if the other ones that you kind of gave up on quickly, you know, maybe if you're good at them after all. I love that. And only do that, I think is the Mm -hmm. operative sentence. Can you get good at only doing that when you're doing it? So I enjoyed this today. And yours was really cool. I was present the whole time with you, brother, because I was fascinated. I was absolutely fascinated. I love your work. And, um, there's a peaceful way about your 
communication style that puts everybody at ease that I know is pleasant. I know this just flew by for everyone. So Thatcher Wine, thank you for being my guest today. And it was great to spend this time with you. Thank you, Ed. I, I loved, you know, monotasking our conversation and, and spending the time with you. So I look forward to uh, keeping the conversation going. I do as well. And everybody, I always tell you, we're the fastest growing show in the world for a reason. It's because you all share it. Our community has exploded. And whether it be Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, Pandora, Sirius, Apple, YouTube, all those platforms are really, really growing. And I just acknowledge that and thank all of you for sharing the show. Continue to win in your life. Max out and God bless you. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around. If you'd like more, click the videos right here. They're exactly what you need to see next. And if you're new here, hit subscribe and become a part of the Max Out community. And tell me what you think about the videos in the comments below. I read all of them every week and I select winners that get all kinds of prizes, gear, coaching calls with me. Make a comment.